Hello, welcome. How is everyone this morning? <laughs> Good, okay. Um, it's very exciting to be able to uh, be here with all of you, and I am, am really um, quite moved to be able to uh, see people who I've been collaborating with um, for uh, five years at least on women's economic leadership and um, more time than that on um, a, a number of other women, gender, and livelihoods projects over the years, like Elora, who I first worked with in 2003. Um, so, so that's a, a, a really wonderful opportunity. I want to say that today, when we're discussing women's economic leadership, um, this is not about experts at front and other people learning. We have all been working and uh, discussing and innovating and learning about how agricultural markets and enterprise programs um, achieve women's economic leadership. And uh, so there will be lots of time to share with each other, and we're actually trying to capture some of the learning um, as we go through the day um, so that uh, we develop new uh, well tools and guidelines as we go along. Um, so, uh, we, we are starting as a, a full group, and the full group um, is going to hear about the innovations on um, women's collective action, which is a piece of research that was done this last year, and also a toolbox of exercises on a rapid analysis of care work, which has to do with the household analysis. Um, and uh, we hope that um, you will um, be able to talk also to the people that have integrated this into uh, the work that they're doing. Um, we, we've got uh, Ethiopia and Tanzania on women's collective action and um, Hector and Celeste talking about rapid care analysis in Honduras. Um, and then have some time for you to be able to um, reflect on if and how this uh, might help your work. Um, we know that uh, for some of you in some regions, women's collective action is um, the motivation, the objective for why you're doing the agricultural markets and enterprise program. For others, um, I think that the attitude is that developing rural um, enterprises and specialized intermediaries is transformational and innovative because of women's economic leadership. Um, and for others, the adaptation programs that you are working on um, are designed to make sure that all women are able to um, have the ability and the capacity to manage risks and keep themselves from falling into poverty. So that is all about women's economic leadership. Um, it's not just a few exceptional women um, that will become business leaders. Um, we know, that, therefore, that you're coming from various different starting points. Uh, not everybody comes to women's economic leadership from the same place. Um, but today is a day so, for us to learn uh, together, and uh, I, we hope the discussions will continue throughout this week in the other themes. So with apologies for... Um, uh, to the EDP colleagues, I'm very quickly going to set the scene for the whole day uh, for those of us in the GEM um, section. Uh, so before the break, we're going to work on these uh, two innovations over this last year. Um, after the break, um, we're going to be looking at um, how Step B and the household analysis has evolved over this past year. Um, including uh, some new work on women-specific risks and gender-based violence uh, assessments. Um, the second part uh, should be called Market Mapping and Advocacy for Women's Economic Leadership. We're going to hear from uh, Asia. Um, and so this is about how we are um, using the GEM Toolkit steps to achieve women's economic leadership. Um, in the afternoon, we're going to get quite practical. Um, a number of us in the room are managers and uh, talking about what are the types of 
expertise in gender that we are looking for when we hire consultants and staff, when we work with partners. Um, and ha so how do we find it and how do we develop that type of combinations of expertise on gender and markets and enterprise in order to achieve uh, well. Um, and the, the last session before the break is that we have a number of approaches to women's empowerment. Um, we have raising her voice, we have we can, we have we man, uh, wise, um, uh, Pwell and Well in different regions have uh, evolved in different ways. Um, and so how are we going to make these approaches complementary and use the best of each tool for the, the context that we're in? Um, the concluding session is a session that will happen every day, as Thomas mentioned yesterday, um, which is meetings by region to take the learning, the insights that you have from the day's discussion and think about how that will inform the plans in your region um, for developing support structures or developing capacities at a country and regional level. And uh, the open session at the end of the day is, is the one that we talked about in the GEM part. Uh, uh, today, uh, we have, I think, three topics. Uh, one topic is about uh, the um, PWELL tool from Asia that um, uh, is going to be discussed and getting everyone's feedback. And the second one, I don't remember. <laughs> um, okay, the second one is how is it that GEM programs are uh, addressing more vulnerable Hello, um, so as Thalia said, I'm going to talk a bit more around the um, findings from the Researching Women's Collective Action Project. Um, as part of our innovations in women's economic leadership from 2012 and 2013. Um, before we start, um, Thalia, would you be able to give those out? Um, so I'm going to um, give out um, a four-page <laughs> overview um, of findings and recommendations um, from the research project. Um, if you already picked one of these up um, yesterday, um, from the German EDP gallery, or if you're in Oxham House and already have one, please don't take one because then we have a limited number. Um, but otherwise, um, please do take them and have a look through. Um, so for those of you who don't know, um, but some of you um, who are already familiar with the project will know, um, we launched about three and a half years ago in December 2009. Uh, the project was launched by Oxfam with funding from the Gates Foundation. And we wanted to look at this one main question. To what extent and under what conditions does women smallholders' engagement in collective action in markets lead to gender equitable outcomes? Um, and that's important for our work around um, GEM and WELL because it helps us decide which um, producer organisations um, to work with um, and what um, support we can offer them so that they can help um, win women benefit more from women's economic leadership. Um, so at Oxfam, we're often asked what types of groups should we support? Should we support wi mixed or women only, um, structured formal groups or informal groups, um, groups that focus on marketing or those that also cover savings um, and training? And before now, we didn't really um, have much research on which to base um, our strategies. Um, so Oxfam and the Gates Foundation worked together with other Oxfam affiliates, including Oxfam America, Oxfam Ireland and Oxfam Novib. Um, as well as a number of external organisations, including CODI, CARE, IFPRI, ODI, SNV, um, IRAM, and a number of um, organisations and research institutions at the national level in our three focus countries, Mali, Tanzania and Ethiopia. And we came up with these four research questions. So, which women participate in, um, in collective action groups and benefit from it? Um, what are these benefits? Is it income, assets, empowerment, all three? Um, what do groups do and not do in order to help um, women smallholders overcome constraints in agricultural markets? Um, and which strategies are most effective um, in helping women to benefit from collective action groups? 
Um, so the third and final phase um, of the research took, part, um, took place in 2012. Um, we undertook in-depth research in one subsector per focus country um, through a stakeholder um, engagement process. We decided to focus on honey in Ethiopia, she butter in Mali, um, and vegetables in Tanzania. Um, and we undertook um, some extensive quantitative research in each of those countries. Altogether, it was almost 3,000 um, interviews and surveys um, which took place across those three countries, so about 1,000 interviews per country. Of those, um, 600 interviews took place with a control group of women who weren't involved in collective action groups, and 300 interviews um, took place with um, a focus group of women who were involved um, in collective action groups. Um, and these women were involved in producing and selling the same product in the same sector, in the same district of one region per country, so that as far as possible we were able to compare like with like. Um, we also undertook qualitative analysis, um, which took the form of four to six um, case studies per country. Um, and so you can see that the extent of the research, um, particularly in regards to the quantitative analysis and the number of interviews, means that the research findings are statistically um, significant and they're relevant not only for these three countries, um, but indeed across sub-Saharan Africa um, and outside um, of sub-Saharan Africa, across different continents, um, which Oxfam works in. Um, and then finally, um, we didn't just look at interve interventions which um, Oxfam um, was undertaking. We looked at different NGOs, um, different producer organisations and government agencies. Um, so this went a lot um, wider than just Oxfam's work. So, um, what are the benefits of women's collective action? Um, well, the research findings showed, luckily, um, that collective action groups are important for women to be able to benefit from agricultural markets. Um, and that's important for our work um, around WELL and GEM um, because we operate on the premise um, that effective economic organisation um, is important for smallholders to be able to gain power in markets. Women um, smallholders who were involved in groups had more income than um, women who were trading alone. Um, we found that women earned 70% more um, in Tanzania and 80% more in uh, Mali and Ethiopia <coughs> than women who weren't involved in groups. And that was because they were producing more and what they were producing was higher quality. We also found that women um, group members had better access to credit, um, greater um, decision-making power over the use of that credit, as well as greater access to market information. However, um, the research findings also showed um, that women's collective action doesn't necessarily alter power relations um, at the household and market level. Um, and as we've um, often found in our own experience of programmes, um, often we need um, other efforts at the political and social level in order to reach that broad-based empowerment and to start to change those power relations. Um, so we found that women weren't always able to get a higher prices um, for their goods. The exception to that was in Ethiopia, um, where the cooperative offered a higher price um, than local traders, so most women producers cho um, chose to sell through their cooperative. And related to that, we found that women didn't always necessarily um, gain greater power in agricultural markets and weren't always um, able to influence um, decisions over prices and price negotiations. Um, and women told us um, that the organisations and the collective action groups that they were involved in um, didn't always help them um, to address the key barriers to their engagement in agricultural markets. So that was things like time poverty, um, limited mobility um, and social constraints which meant um, that they were limited in the kind of activities and roles which they could get involved in. Um, we also found that although women had increased income, increased access to credit and increased market information, this didn't always lead um, to broad-based empowerment. Um, we found that in only a few um, decision-making domains um, were women um, in groups significantly more empowered than those who weren't in groups. Um, and for example, in um, increased decision-making over household assets um, and household expenditure, we didn't find that there was a significant um, difference between those women who were involved in groups and those um, who weren't. So there was really an uneven relationship um, between um, empowerment and group membership. And this tended to vary according to the context um, and the country which women were in. Um, we also found um, that um, empowerment benefits, however, um, were more significant um, 
when women were involved both in formal groups and in informal groups. Um, so when, where women were able to get benefits um, from different types of groups, um, that meant that um, they had better empowerment benefits. Um, finally, the findings showed that some women weren't able to benefit from collective action groups um, because of elite capture, um, and that also marginalised women weren't always able to get involved in collective action groups um, and therefore benefit from them. Um, so finally, I'm going to talk about what the findings showed about effective support <coughs> strategies. Um, so some of these um, we already, already know about in GEM, um, but some of them are new um, to our programme work and the GEM approach. Um, so focusing on high-value products that women can control, um, which is something which we're already aware of in our work around GEM and EDP. Analyzing the market, including gender dynamics, which is, of course, a very essential part of um, the GEM approach. The provision of women-friendly technology um, to increase the quality of women products and to al women's products and to allow them to access new markets. So, for example, um, in Ethiopia, the provision of modern beehives um, so that um, women can produce a better quality of honey and overcome constraints, um, social constraints about climbing trees, which women weren't able to get involved in, um, and also land constraints, so that women were able to have these beehives at the bottom of their garden. Um, supporting direct engagement in markets rather than the more traditional support strategies for women smallholders around savings and credit, um, microfinance and production techniques. Um, and the importance of supporting informal groups as well um, as formal groups, sing um, women only groups as well as mixed groups. As I was saying bef before, we found that um, women got different benefits from different types of groups. Um, so, for example, um, from a small women only informal group, um, they might be able to get increased savings and increased self confidence um, or increased skills from training. But then um, in larger mixed um, cooperatives, they would have better access to transport, better access to resources, um, and better access access to market networks. Um, engaging with men to ensure their support and um, to mitigate any resistance that they might have to their wives joining collective action groups um, and also to get their help um, with access to um, resources um, and land, um, which was definitely the case um, in Mali with shea butter and um, in Tanzania with vegetables. Um, as I was saying before, avoiding elite capture through equitable and accountable leadership and transparent governance. Um, uh, and then um, advocacy work um, to ensure a favourable cooperative um, and policy environment, um, which was what really helped um, collective action groups in Mali to flourish. Um, and then as well as that, um, advocacy at the local level, for example, um, in Ethiopia around cooperative bylaws, which was preventing more than one... Um, household member um, joining cooperative groups, which meant that women and wives were often excluded, um, and that was successfully lobbied against. And then finally, realising um, that women are not a homogenous group, um, and that it's also important to look at younger women, younger wives, um, unmarried women, um, and women who are less wealthy, because they were the ones who are often excluded um, and not able to join collective action groups. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's the end of my summary of the findings. Please do um, read the four pages because they'll have some more information in them. Um, if you would like more information, um, there is our Oxfam <coughs> International Research Report by Sally Baden, um, Unlocking the Potential of Agricultural Markets. And there are a couple of copies of that um, in the GEM EDP gallery <coughs> on the Oxfam Policy and Practice table. Um, we've also got um, one case study per focus country, which again are in the um, GEM EDP gallery on the Women's Collective Action table, and um, the four pages you have with you now. Um, and if you'd like to download um, a digital copy of these products, um, they're available on the Women's Collective Action website, or if you search for Women's Collective Action on the Policy and Practice website, um, you'll also be able to find them there. Um, I'm going to hand over to Ralph and Mulu now, who are going to talk about how they've been able to integrate some of these findings into their programme policy and advocacy work. I think Ralph is first. Yep. Yes, yep. there you go. Yeah, so how, how, what have we done with um, these lessons? And uh, I'm uh, giving exam five examples, and there's, there's plenty of more stuff that's come out of this research, but uh, I'll just keep it short. Um, first of all, uh, one of the findings was that women in collective action tend to be older and wealthier. So it's kind of an exclusive group um, that is benefiting. So what do we do about that? Um, in, in Tanzania, we worked through several value chain um, projects, sunflower, local chicken, vegetable, sisal. 
Um, and um, there's different type of groups that are active and that we work with to, and, and make uh, women participate. And one uh, group that is very popular among women is an informal saving and lending uh, group. We call it SILK. Uh, and that is as a low threshold, uh, low, uh, everybody can participate uh, and women learn about financial management and the value of saving and, and the benefits that saving have in terms of uh, being able to spend later on, on things that you like to spend on. Uh, and these groups, um, because they are saving, uh, saving groups, they generate money for all women uh, to be able to participate in other groups such as uh, production groups and markets, uh, producer marketing groups uh, that are much more uh, higher profile where you have to um, contribute high amounts of money. So that's one way where we uh, encourage very uh, participation in uh, for informal groups to lead naturally into the more formal uh, more higher up um, the, the market chain uh, participation. Uh, the second one is women in collective action enjoy greater, uh, greater freedom of movement. That's a general um, learning from that we had from this uh, research. Um, how do you uh, incorporate that and how do you maximize this uh, freedom of movement? Um, well, we also realize that it's actually the the, the, the men that determine whether women uh, are able to f uh, freely move or not. Um, so really the, the, the issue here is creating uh, awareness among men that uh, if you allow women to participate in processes and go beyond, uh, travel beyond the groups, beyond the villages and participate in other meetings that are a little bit further away than your, your immediate comfort zone, it does have benefits and it's not that bad after all. Uh, and expo exposing, uh, facilitating cross visits of women who have done this before, going to villages uh, where this is kind of like a, a novelty that does help in uh, changing men's uh, perspectives. Next one, please. Faster, okay. Um, the, the, another finding is high bureaucracy in group registration processes, uh, which, which was a big constraint. Um, and there was another constraint um, that uh, group membership doesn't necessarily lead to improved access to resources. Now, I've grouped them together because the, what we are doing um, to overcome these constraints is advocacy approaches. For instance, in the vegetable and rice valley chain, um, we have advocacy um, uh, components, and that is to interact with local governments um, and uh, influence uh, local policies and practices that actually inhib inhibit uh, group formation, uh, co cooperatives, and, and most of all, uh, women participation in, uh, in registration of groups. Um, <coughs> secondly, we work with the, uh, an initiative called Female Food Heroes. Um, that is a, a nationwide initiative where um, through television, kind of big brother show on TV, Women have been elected as uh, role models, and these role models, we use them in our programs as um, uh, change agents and um, uh, make them uh, um, uh, change, do, um, influence changes for the better of the women. Uh, the last one, um, through NGO networks and direct interaction policy makers, we lobby improvements in the agriculture in initiatives. There's plenty of in, uh, agriculture initiatives uh, that we can change. Next one. And then last but not least, uh, a positive uh, example, a positive finding is that women collective action does uh, result in, in, in improved incomes. Uh, and that is what we carry on in all our value chains. Um, different type of value chains, but we don't only select value chains that are in, in the comfort zone of women. We also try to uh, change the way um, um, markets are run. Um, the, the change the way women and uh, men interact in certain uh, crops uh, so that women, uh, uh, what, what we achieve is, um, is a general change in agricultural systems. Thanks very much. Well, uh, the, uh, the study uh, that, in, uh, that, as it has been said, it was concluded very recently, but it had uh, three phases. So uh, there were uh, preliminary findings that have led us to pick up some of the key findings when when the research was uh, started. 
So we had focused on three of the uh, major findings of this research area that, that we uh, felt through working the, uh, with women collective actions can help women empowerment, specifically focusing on the economic empowerment and the social empowerment. So the areas that we focused were the, uh, the increase in income when they come into uh, collective forms, and then uh, the contribution or the benefit that they get for increasing decision making or increasing power, and then uh, the increased access to service, both the extension service and uh, the uh, financial service. So the, the, uh, the, uh, the, the areas that we were focused in terms of picking up the findings from this research and integrating into our programs would evolve around these three major areas. So, uh, w I mean, uh, again, based on the uh, findings, what we did was that uh, if the collective action can increase the income and can increase their power in decision making and uh, increase the access to service, then we found out, I mean, we uh, felt that we need to do an analysis, further analysis on what the barriers could be that could prevent women from increasing uh, the income or involving in the collective actions. So we did a, a, a target uh, gender uh, analysis and then uh, they, we developed the gender mainstreaming uh, strategy based on the analysis that we had. And then uh, again, uh, we also targeted the commodities that are women friendly and that could lead to increasing the income of women. Like I think the example of the honey uh, was uh, one, one area that the, with the introduction of the beehives, the modern beehives, or bringing the, uh, the traditional hives from the branches of the tree to the backyard had significantly changed the income that reached to the woman and the, the, house, uh, the household. So the uh, selection and identification of opportunities and challenges uh, in, the, uh, in the technologies. And again, there are technologies that are woman friendly, or there are technologies that have been picked up by women and then again grabbed by other, by other groups. Like a very good example that came from this research was uh, the spice. It was traditionally the domain of women. But because of the change in the market dynamics now, it has been taken by, by uh, like the big commercial investors. So we have to find technology that still women can play a role and that we uh, focused on honey. Uh, again, uh, we, we, we still have remind vigilant to look into the challenges and opportunities, as I said, in the value, in the value chain. What are the, role, the challenges that women could, uh, that could face in the value chain? Uh, then uh, we uh, have been working at the immediate level, immediate needs, or at the grassroots as well as the strategic at the uh, macro levels. So at the grassroots level, still we continue to work on mobilizing women like into the self-help groups where they practice the, uh, their, uh, their leadership and they come together and discuss both the economic and other issues. And also that uh, has to be supported with the macro level where we work with the uh, regional and the federal cooperatives. In the Ethiopian context, I think we have, uh, I don't know if that is the case also in other countries, but there is a law in the country <coughs> for every cooperative or for every groups that has to go through a, through a process to get certified or to get the registration. And once they get the registration, there are privileges that they get in terms of the access to finance, credit, and other agricultural extension service. But I mean, they have to pass through a process. So uh, again, the existing uh, policy practice that systematically exclude women, like a very good example in one of the project areas of Amhara was that only one member of a household can be a member of the cooperative, which automatically would be the household head, which is a man, which systematically excludes women. So we had to work with the uh, regional cooperatives policy on changing those kind of policies. And also we had to mobilize the women into self-help groups and they have to practice some of the leadership and they have to get the, the, uh, the, uh, the experience. So uh, that's one thing that we did. And I think one of the uh, success that we had uh, in, this, in this area is like, uh, fortunately the regional cooperatives, I mean, we had used the regional stakeholders forums where the policy makers, the private sector, the women themselves and the producer organization come together and discuss those kind of issues and how that could affect the family and the smallholders and now uh, the regional government has was forced after over two years of process to revise the policy and I think now it was recently ratified that they have uh, instituted the prerequisites of women membership in registering any cooperatives 
and have a lord also that dual membership in any cooperative so that the man and woman and any family members who uh, have the capacity and had reached the age of 16 can be a member of any cooperatives and I think this is one of the major success that we can uh, we can I mean uh, testify then I, I think the recruitment of the women economic leadership officers at the grassroots level as advisors to our partners and also as uh, the hands to mobilize the women was instrumental in like working and addressing the issues at the grassroots level. They are like the uh, daily advisors both to our partners and to the women's self-help groups and the cooperatives and including to the extent of supporting the unions and the cooperatives to revise their bylaws on how they can include women and how they can revisit their existing bylaws to include uh, like the dividend issues and how women can benefit from that process. Then, uh, well, as I said, again, using the multi-stakeholders forums at the regional and national level was instrumental because that was the combination of all the policymakers and the development practitioners and the private sector and the women themselves in terms of lobbying and influencing the policies. Yeah, that's good. Just very quickly. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. Yeah. So, I mean, through those process, finally, uh, we have... Uh, I mean, transform the cash program uh, from numbers, not women only uh, saying that we have reached this number of women, but also the number of women that have benefited and the number of women that have taken the leadership. Like, I mean, this is, this is one of the examples that we have that they have set up their own enterprise and they have, they are, they have the shareholding of 60% of the enterprise. But I think one of the success actually that we have done is one of the uh, women that was a beneficiary or a target of this project was one of the uh, national uh, heroes that got the prize from the prime minister, which is like the biggest uh, change. Then uh, the intervention at each stage of the chain I have identified the organizing self groups to access training, credit inputs, and markets. Thank you. <laughs> well, I think that is the last. Well, the IFAL was also instrumental in influencing the agricultural extension policies. Thank you. Yeah, okay. Excuse me? Yeah? Well, I found uh, really up to the point in terms of Georgia's my little program we have experienced. I have two very short, clarifying questions, if I may. Firstly, uh, about uh, provision into the law and cooperatives. So, if I've taken it rightly, so it was a restriction that only one member of the household could be eligible to be a member of the cooperative. So, uh, yes, is that's it right. related that it is also a restriction to be a member only of one cooperative, or simultaneously this member of the household could be a member of another cooperative? But, uh, okay. This is one. And second, uh, you mentioned and I found it very interesting about recruiting women economic leadership officers. But the question is, where do you find them? Where do you bring them from? <laughs> okay, I'm going to take a couple more questions, um, and then uh, uh, Thomas, uh, um, and then Claudia. Yep. I just want to uh, discuss actually. You want to ask that how about the social change at the household level? Like with this women involved in the cooperative, they gave the economic leadership. But what about at the household level, are they still being increased, beaten up or not? <laughs> and the second thing is about uh, the kind of, you know, the first, first slide says that so the women who are producers are involved into these collectives. So what about the women who do not produce, but are the labor? Are they also the general members or not? Right. Okay. Um, and Claudia had a question? Sorry. Yeah, at, at our table we talked about how, um, you know, how exciting it is to see these results and, and how it, this research provides clear evidence about why we should be promoting wealth. Um, the fact that in some countries, uh, women involved in, in collective action are earning up to 80% more than women who are not involved is very exciting to see. Um, but I, I was wondering if you could talk more about why you why there's evidence that suggests that women are not, uh, that power relations aren't being impacted by their participation in, in collective action. Why is it that they're not uh, accessing higher prices, for example? 
Oh, complicated questions. Okay, uh, I know. I, I'm thinking. Okay, as as we get the mic around, I just want to say um, we are going to be talking about um, household level change throughout the day, um, and especially in about five minutes uh, about talking about the rapid care analysis, and um, we we also. Um, I'm sorry. I, I I'll just get Thomas's next question. Yes. Yeah, next question. Hi, thank you. Um, I just uh, have, have a question. Um, yesterday there were some talks about uh, perception of risk and and uh, how that impacts behavior and, and economic livelihood of, of the people from yesterday. But uh, so I, w I wonder if collective action leads to different uh, behavioral change, especially perception of risk. Um, that might or might not lead to different decision making uh, outcome or, or practice within the group. Okay. Um, so I'm going to answer a couple of questions quickly and then hand over to Mulu. Um, uh, about laborers, um, I think it is fascinating to think uh, about how we can be addressing women who are operating as smallholder farmers and producers and operating as laborers because they're often the same women. So often in the same household, you will have people that are both a farmer and a laborer. Um, and uh, actually, uh, one of the case studies that's coming up uh, later today, we'll, we'll talk about that. Um, in terms of risk management, yes, um, one of the hypotheses of the Women's Collective Action Research was that not only uh, if you are in a group do you get access to services, access to finance, <coughs> access to market information, but you are also better able to manage risk. Um, commercial risk, uh, simply the risk of if you get ill, you, you have a group that is uh, working with you. Um, uh, the disaster risk management, the information about adaptation strategies and climate change as well. Um, we did find that to some extent. Um, however, I, I think that what we uh, were challenged by in this research is that it was so complicated to actually do a rigorous quantitative survey to demonstrate scientifically that there was um, a statistical, sig statistically significant difference in income or in control over assets or in decision making between uh, women who are in a group and women who are not in a group producing in the same sector in the same region. I, that was a huge challenge. So although some of the work that, that you've just heard presented may seem obvious to you, it actually took a tremendous amount of work over three years to prove it. Um, and this kind of uh, evidence is very important when you go to ministries of agriculture, policy makers, and say, yes, we actually do need more investment in producer organizations and marketing associations so that we are including women, we are including marginal women, and we are promoting women to, to be leaders of these organizations. What we found, however, was that producer organizations that are mostly dominated by men and looking at markets um, are um, not always dealing with the range of barriers that women have as compared to what men have in terms of accessing and having power in markets, such as um, time issues, uh, cultural norms and beliefs, labor sharing, um, confidence, skill building, barriers to join groups, uh, things like having uh, only one member of your household being able to be a member of the cooperative. There are lots of explicit and implicit gender inequalities in how cooperatives function. Um, and then between women that we have, um, as Imogen was saying, uh, a, a lot of elite capture of the groups that we as development uh, funders are funding so that you have better off women 
um, getting the benefits and worse off women not being included. So we have a lot to do to be able to say it, it's not just a simple thing of getting women into a group or finding more women on your management committee of your producer group. Um, and, and that's the complexity of what we want to be able to um, share with you so that you think more so in a more sophisticated way um, about how all of us are engaging with producer groups. There's a lot of complexity in here that we, that we could talk about. I'm going to hand over to Mulu. Well, thank you, Talia. Well, uh, I mean, in my presentation, I only gave a very small flavor of all the uh, work that we did, and probably you can have a detailed discussion further. But I mean to respond to some of the uh, quick queries regarding the uh, cooperative uh, policies in Ethiopia. In Ethiopia, we have uh, the uh, federal system and uh, regions. They have their own laws, and they we have the the, uh, the national law. Uh, and again, the uh, the unions or the cooperatives also they have their own law, which we traditionally call it the bylaw, which somehow is developed based on the regional laws. So at the national level, the existing national policy doesn't exclude anyone from being a member of any cooperatives. But the regional states, they have uh, modified the law to fit into their own interests or into their own design. So uh, they have developed a policy which states a kind of law or policy that almost one member of the family household can be a member of any cooperative. And there is also another practice that you can't have more than one cooperative in uh, one sub-district. So there are two issues. One is the membership, and the other one is the number of cooperatives that you can have per sub-district. So these were the two challenges that we had. Again, women, uh, the self-help groups, which is a kind of sub-cooperative, they are not legally recognized, and they are not registered, and they operate as informal groups. But those are the entry points that we have used, and those are the most sustainable groups that have been there in the country uh, for, I don't know, for how many generations. They are sustainable, and they are the best entry points that we have used to graduate them and to, to join the existing cooperatives or set up their own cooperatives, and also practice the leadership, because it's set up based on existing relations and common interests and that is also the institution that people trust and that they have the confidence to uh, express their common interest issues, both at household level, the community level, and whatever. So that's, uh, that is the entry point that they use to exercise the leadership and also the potential to uh, graduate into cooperatives or other, uh, other uh, community institutions. So that is the entry point that we used, where the, uh, especially the well officers were supporting the partners to mobilize and support those uh, groups into self-help, into cooperatives or survey. So the, the, the issue is both the membership and the number of cooperatives that the regional policy was, was restricting. So we had to work with the regional government and other actors to revisit those policies, which they have now revised it. With regards to the well officers, I think, uh, well, there are, there are uh, two levels. One is the grassroots well officers that they have helped us to deliver the job and that we're working closely with the partners and with the self-help groups. And then we have deliberately targeted the staff that have some understanding and some knowledge about the women issues, the gender issues in the Ethiopian context. And we have to invest to build their capacity to take them to the next level. And we have the senior advisor, the gender, the gender advisor at the country level who is providing this regular support to those officers. But we have to invest to get the return. Unless we invest, we can't, we can't make change. And it, that was a deliberate decision and a proactive decision for the country team. Uh, 